Live from the WBZ Studios, a campaign 2020 special. The Massachusetts Senate debate starts right now. Well, good evening and welcome to the WBZ Senate debate between the candidates in the September 1st Democratic primary. I'm John Keller, political analyst for WBZ, with a special hello as well to our viewers online at CBSN Boston and across the country on C-SPAN and our radio audience on WBZ News Radio 1030. Let's meet the candidates. The incumbent, Ed Markey, has represented Massachusetts in the U.S. Senate since 2013. Before that, he served in the U.S. House for 37 years. The challenger, Joe Kennedy, has served in the U.S. House since 2013. Now, before we get started, a brief word about our format. There will be no opening or closing statements. The candidates will each get one minute to respond to the same question. After that, there will be open-ended periods of rebuttal and discussion, otherwise known as debate, during which they are free to question one another and expand their focus to other topics. There are just three hard and fast rules. No filibustering. No talking over each other, and always obey your moderator. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate you being here. Let's begin our debate. And uh, you'll uh, go in alphabetical order, so Mr. Kennedy, you'll take the first question first, then Senator Markey will take the, the second one. Uh, throughout this campaign, I keep hearing the same question from voters who aren't already committed to one of you. What's the difference between these two? So let's try to give them some clarity tonight. What is the most important difference between you and your opponent? One minute. John, thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. Look, I believe you deserve more out of your senator. If there's a connective thread between the election of Donald Trump, the devastation of COVID-19, and the moment of racial justice, it's that we have a government that is disconnected from its people. We have a middle class, an economy that makes it almost impossible to be middle class, a health care system where the sick can't afford care, a, a justice system where black and brown lives are stolen. And we have politicians in Washington that think that these problems are going to be solved in some back room someplace, not in our communities here at home. And that's why I'm running. That's the biggest difference between myself and Senator Markey. Senator Markey doesn't live here. He spent less time in the state than Elizabeth Warren did when she was running for president. And he says that he needs to be in Washington voting for us. But he missed over 50% of the votes in this critical time of COVID-19, a public health and economic catastrophe. Oh, we need more out of this seat. Okay, and if elected, I'll give it to you. Time, same question, Senator Markey. Uh, thank you, John, Congressman Kennedy. I, I know that so many of uh, the voters are sitting at home right now with a ballot to decide who to vote for. I know many are considering me because of my proven leadership and experience. And I know that many are looking at Congressman Kennedy uh, through all of his negative ads that he's been running on television. Um, he keeps using the word change. Well, the people in Massachusetts don't need to make a choice because I represent experience and change at the same time. I do both. I am inspiring a generation of young people to rise up on the Green New Deal and other issues to get into politics in our country. Congressman Kennedy, when he uses the word change, he means something different. He's changed his position on Medicare for All. He's changed his position on PROMESA, which is hollowing out Puerto Rico. He's changed his position uh, on the issue uh, of uh, super PACs. He's changed his position on the racist fraternity. That's his own words that he ha was in for 20 years and he only okay. uh, left that fraternity at, at one month before this campaign you began. Can, and, it's a, and, and it is a fraternity inspired by Robert E. Lee. You can you expand cannot, on this changing the open rebuttal. Let's, let's go to our open so, rebuttal. Go ahead. So, uh, Senator, Ed, you've known me my whole life. It is sad to hear you say those things. Um, you're running on your record. So let's examine that record. You say that you stand for racial justice. You voted for three strikes, you're out. You voted for mass incarceration. You opposed the integration of the Boston public schools. And when a, young, when a mom and dad came to you to ask for, their just, for justice from their murdered black son, you literally did nothing 
to help them. You say you stand for economic equity. One of the proudest bills that you say you passed was the Telecommunications Act, which led to thousands of people losing their jobs here in Massachusetts. And when those workers went to meet with you, you wouldn't even meet with them. You say that uh, you stand for the, 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 the change that we bring. You voted for the Iraq War, which continues to send young men and women to the Middle East to fight for a war that didn't begin until after, before they were born. Let them respond. Yeah. Um, on the issue of racial justice, in 1973, there was no black Senate seat in Massachusetts. I had to side with Bill Owens, with Mel King, and Doris Bunty to cast a vote <coughs> to defy the Democratic leadership that was not going to allow a black Senate seat to be created in the state of Massachusetts. I did so jeopardizing my own relationship with the leadership. I did that. On the issue of ensuring that every child gets the internet on their desk for learning, that's my program. Rich or poor, every child has the internet on their desk. That's my program. With Cory Booker, I have introduced the Next Step Act to overhaul the, uh, the criminal justice system in our country. With Kamala Harris, I have introduced the legislation to provide $2,000 per individual in our country per month in order to make sure that they get what they need for health care. That, that they get what they need for food, for rent, for the mortgage, so they can pay the bills every single month. Rep that is my leadership on Senator, those issues. Senator, so this is important. A mom and dad came to you to ask for justice for their murdered son. They came to you as their United States Senator, as somebody in a position of power who they thought could help them rectify what had happened to their slain young boy. And when they came to you to ask for help, you did nothing. The only thing you did months later was sign on to a letter that my office put together. I have stood by that family through thick and thin, year after year since, pushing on the Department of Justice, pushing on authorities in New York, doing everything we possibly can and continue to this day. So it's great that you talk about the things that you might have done or the bills that you might have passed, while you were just trying to fight for that seat that you say that Mr. Owens had, you were opposing the integration of the Boston Public Schools. Re response. Look it. The Henry family deserves justice. I can't fathom the pain which the Henry family must feel for the loss of a child. The pain is unimaginable. But what Congressman Kennedy is saying, it's just not true. I have two letters right here that Congressman Kennedy and I wrote in 2014 to Eric Holder, the Attorney General of the United States, to ask for an opening of a case to provide justice for the Henry family. In May of 2014, we wrote to Eric Holder. In December of 2014, with Elizabeth Warren, we also wrote to make sure that there would be an opening of this case. So when Congressman Kennedy says that I did nothing, he knows it's not true. Senator, he knows know. it is a falsehood, Here's and he keeps repeating it because back then I stood with him to fight to make sure that this case was opened. Go ahead. Let's get, let's get this very clear. It's not my words that said you did nothing. It's Mr. Henry's words who said that you did nothing. You signed a letter, Senator, that my office put together after months of trying to get you on that letter. Now, it's great that you signed it, but for those out there that are wondering what the difference is between myself and Senator Markey, this is literally it. When, you say, when I say that there's more to this job than the bills that you file and the votes that you cast, this is it. Because I pushed on the Obama administration. I pushed on the authorities in New York I pushed on him in, in Washington, D.C. We filed legislation. I've met with, I met repeatedly with the family. I've attended their benefit every year, or almost every year, that they started in honor of their son to provide scholarships for uh, underprivileged kids. And I'm still in contact with some of your Senate colleagues today, pushing on this administration, pushing on authorities in New York City. Why? Because you're a U.S. Senator, and I'm a congressman, you and there's something that you can do about it when a parent ask you for justice for their murdered son. Go ahead. And you had that it, choice. It, 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 and you didn't. Look it. You, you it's said just that not you deserve justice. It is at a time. They, they didn't it, get it from let, their let office. Let them respond. They, they didn't get it from you. It, it, it is just not true. 
what Congressman Kennedy is saying. I have a letter here with his signature next to mine. Not on one letter, two letters, right next to each other, our names, asking Eric Holder of the Justice Department to open an investigation. So when he says, I did nothing, he knows it's not true. He knows it's a falsehood. He keeps making a false accusation that I did nothing. And he keeps repeating it, knowing that that is completely and totally not true. And so the evidence is right here. The letters are right here. And we acted together as partners. And that was right, that we should do so. But to say I did not partner with him is just absolutely untrue. It's a misrepresentation. It is a falsehood. And he should just stop saying it. So we have every parent out there of a child. If you believe, if your son was murdered, your young boy was murdered by a police officer, and you came to a United States senator, and you asked for their help, and the response that you got was months later to sign a letter, I ask you if you think that that is sufficient. I don't. Oh. Apparently, Senator Markey does. I'll give you the final word on this, again, and it, then I want to move on. It is not one letter, it's two letters. And our staffs work together on drafting the, leg the, drafting the language in those letters. So again, what he's saying is not true. What he's saying is a misrepresentation. And I just absolutely think he should stop it, okay. uh, because otherwise, these signatures of myself and him and Elizabeth Warren on these letters uh, is I, absolutely something point, that I, I he is disrespecting in terms of the partnership we created to help to get justice I, for the Henry family. Last point. I want to move on, but super okay, fast, last please. Point. It's not my criticism, Senator, that you should be concerned about. Those words as they're saying you did nothing aren't mine. They're DJ's father. Equ they're coming from the family. That's the issue. Equal not time. with me. Equal time. Well, again, Congressman Kennedy is making these charges right now. Okay. And it's not true. Okay. He knows it's not true, and he should not <clears throat> be making the charges. All he right. knows better. All right, since we're talking about uh, social justice, racial justice, and so forth, uh, this question you'll start here, uh, Mr. Markey. There's been lots of talk in Democratic circles about empowering people of color politically. Joe Biden did it today with his choice of Senator Kamala Harris to be his running mate. Let's learn more about your commitment to that goal, each of you. For most of the past 20 years, Boston has been a majority non-white city, and yet the city has yet to be run by a mayor of color, even as dozens of other major cities have elected non-white mayors. It seems likely <coughs> that a well-qualified person of color will make the runoff to challenge incumbent Mayor Marty Walsh next year. Will you pledge right now to support that qualified person of color? Senator, one minute. Well, first of all, I would say this, that it's impossible to predict the future. It just is. You're asking a hypothetical. And, uh, and Mayor Walsh is doing a good job right now. I will just say that right up front. And, uh, you know, I'm in a race here with Congressman Kennedy. We're unsure of the outcome just three weeks from now, much less two years from now that you're now talking about. Next year. Uh, but, I, but I just want to go back again to 1973, uh, when I stood with the Black Caucus to make sure there would be a black Senate seat in Boston. I did stand with them, and that's why they are endorsing me in this race. Those people who were there long ago trying to get justice uh, for Boston, I stood with them, I fought with them, and we won. That's why there is a black Senate seat in the city of Boston right now. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, one minute. Correct that record here real fast. Senator, again, you referenced the work with a, a seat with Senator Owens that the majority of Democrats voted to create that seat. And while you were working on that, you opposed the integration of the Boston public schools. I don't think racial justice is something that you can cherry pick. Racial justice is something you are committed to or you are not. With regards to your, your question, uh, John, <coughs> Mayor Walsh, I think, is doing a good job. I think if there's a lesson from this moment in politics, no one knows what the heck's going to happen. Uh, and I think there are a number of... Uh, we have seen uh, an extraordinary empowerment of uh, particularly women of color, uh, a number of uh, very talented uh, members of, uh, of the city council. But I think it's far too early to predict if anyone's going to jump into that race. And I think Mayor Walls certainly deserves the chance to make his case. Rebuttal? <coughs> oh, yeah. Uh, just another correction of the congressman. Uh, it was not a majority of Democrats that voted to create that black Senate seat uh, in 1973. It was a small minority of Democrats who bucked their own party leadership uh, in the House of Representatives at that time, a small minority. We actually had to join with the Republicans to support 
Governor Frank Sargent at that time. There were 55 Republicans. Only took a small number of Democrats out of a huge number. I was part of that small number of Democrats who did that. That is just completely untrue. It was not a majority of Democrats, but a small minority, and I joined with them to create justice to ensure that there would be a black Senate seat in the city. In response. Again, uh, Senator, <clears throat> the fact is that as you say that you are advocating for the creation of that seat, on one of the most searing racial justice moments in Massachusetts history, for the integration of the Boston public schools, you chose uh, to support the continued segregation. That was your choice. Now, the issue here isn't that it was just one choice. You have continued, you, you opposed busing. You have, you voted for three strikes and mass incarceration. You still refuse to apologize for the consequences of the 1994 crime bill. You joined with Republicans against the Obama administration, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Democrats, and were the only member of the House Democratic delegation to vote to maintain the number of immigration detention beds used to detain immigrants. And when a f mom and dad came to ask you for justice for their okay. murdered son, this isn't some, some, some bill, this is a family in front of you. All right, that's a laundry list there. You take your time and respond. <coughs> you know, yeah, thank you, John, very much. Um, the, the, um, the crime bill was supported by every member of the Massachusetts delegation, uh, by Nancy Pelosi, by Joe Biden, because it had uh, provisions in there that created the Violence Against Women Act. It was a ban on, um, a ban on assault weapons. Uh, the sentencing guidelines were clearly wrong. They need to be corrected. Uh, and I do believe that is something that has to be done, and that's what I'm partnering with uh, Cory Booker with the Next Step app to achieve. But on this immigration <coughs> bed issue, let me just again say very clearly uh, that Congressman Kennedy, later on in the same year, he cast a vote for a bill that had the very same provision in it. I did not support uh, increasing those, uh, those beds. I was working hard, and I was successful in putting a ban on knives on planes because of what happened at Logan Airport, because of the hijacking, because of the murder of 150 people by Mohammed Atta and the other nine hijackers on that day, and I, and I knew it was knives on planes, and there was an effort that was going to allow knives back into the passenger uh, cabin of planes. So I worked to successfully to get that language in. But on the issue of those beds, in that one bill, yes, but it was because I was successful in banning knives on planes. But later on in the same year, Congressman Kennedy, in another bill, voted for the very same language. So give me a break, Congressman. You did the exact same thing, but in a different bill. Go ahead. So, <clears throat> sorry, everybody, but we're going to correct this record again. Senator, you had a chance to vote as to whether we should lower the number of immigrant detention beds or not. You are the only member of the Massachusetts delegation to side with Republicans to pass that bill. The only one. Fact. You now claim that it has something to do with knives on a plane. This was 12 years after 9-11. The issue on knives was, was worked out earlier that day. Earlier today, it, this amendment had nothing to do, this bill had nothing to do with it. But yet, you still cast that vote. That was your choice. Because you and ben joined with Republicans and passed that bill, it got wrapped up in an overall government funding measure. The difference between our two votes is you had the chance to stand with an immigrant community and the Massachusetts delegation and President Obama and the Hispanic Caucus, and you chose not to, to stand with Republicans. When it came back to vote to fund government or not, because they passed the bill that you voted for, we had to, we had to swallow it to fund government. One final go-round on this. Thank, and thank you, John. Thank you, John. And again... Congressman Kennedy, later on in the same year, cast the same vote. It was in a large package again, large package then, as it was in a large package the time before. That's the legislative process. Uh, and I think we both opposed increasing those beds. We both did. Okay? But to say that he did not vote to, uh, on a bill to increase those beds is just absolutely wrong. Thank you. He might say we both oppose it. I voted against it. He voted for it. All right. Let's <coughs> move on. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, You'll start here first, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, President Trump was criticized recently for warning voters that Joe Biden's pledge to expand and enforce the Fair Housing Act would mean an influx of crime and a loss of property values for suburban homeowners. 
Do you believe the government should do more to promote suburban racial and economic diversity? And if so, what should be done? Yes. One without, minute. Without question. Um, look, what I think this moment has taught many, but uh, I think some of us have known before, is the myriad ways in which there has been uh, structural racism codified at every level of government, federal, state, and local. And one of the most prolific examples of that, John, has been the Fair Housing Act in combination with local zoning laws. We have in Boston, as of 2018, the median net worth of a white household is $247,000. The median net worth of a black household is eight bucks. That disparity comes up, down to one, uh, lack of economic opportunity, lack of good wages, good uh, paying jobs, but the inability to then gain access to a housing market. If we are going to take on the structural racism that we need to in order to provide opportunity for truly every American, we need to be good to our promise and good to our values. And we need to invest in additional housing stock and rectify the ills of, those, of the Fair Housing Act. Mr. Markey, one minute. Look at, um, Donald Trump says he wants to make America great again. He really wants to make America hate again. And what he's doing is just systematically trying to find issues that can somehow or other get them votes out in the suburbs. That's what it's all about. It's just racism, plain and simple. He's the most racist president of all time in our country's history. And so we just have to break down these suburban barriers uh, that make it more difficult for minority families to be able to move in. I live in Malden. Uh, we have a very racially diverse community. But every community in the suburbs should be similarly diverse. And that has to be the goal of the federal government next year. We have to put justice on the ballot for housing policies in our country to make sure that this historic bias that goes all the way back to slavery, by the way, in terms of black families able to accumulate enough wealth to own homes in the suburbs so that we begin to rectify that historic injustice that is built deeply into the fabric of our country's history. All right, response here, and I'd like some clarity, more clarity from both of you on exactly what you would do to integrate the suburbs. Yeah, so, John, in responding to, to Senator Markey's point, though, so I agree largely with what he said. We, do, we as the federal government need to do more in order to tackle those systemic structures. The difference is, is that at multiple points over Senator Markey's career, he's actually exacerbated those challenges. He hasn't tried to level those barriers. Voting for three strikes you're out and mass incarceration sent a generation of African-American men to jail. Opposing busing in our school system was not, is not a, a way to break down structural barriers around race. It, it continues to codify them and perpetuates them. Voting to detain more immigrants or to keep immigration beds as high as they can, that's not a way that you actually integrate immigrate immigrants into our community. That's a way to separate, to, to, pro, to exacerbate fear, and to exacerbate division. That's Senator Markey's record when it comes to racial justice in, a, in this country. Response. Okay, first of all, I changed my position on busing 40 years ago, just so I can get that out 40 years ago, and it was because of Mel King, Bill Owens, Doris Bunty, and others. That was 40 years ago. In terms of the housing issue in the suburbs right now, we need state laws that pass that are tough. State laws that just break down these discriminatory barriers that exist in suburban communities all across the state of Massachusetts. We need federal policies that provide the funding uh, for families who have historically uh, not had the, the ability to be able to put down the deposit to be able to uh, live in the suburbs. So we need something that happens at the local level, the state level, and the federal level. And we have to say that we are about to have a moment of justice for these families. Justice that ensures they get the health care, they get the education, they get the housing, they get the criminal justice that they deserve. We're at a big moment in our country's history. We can see it on the streets of our country. The soul of our country is on fire. And one of the things we have to do is to put housing in the suburbs at the top of the list of things that we're going to provide for those communities that have been historically excluded. Go ahead. So, Senator, I actually agree with you that we are at this big moment and that we have, out of this record comes a reckoning for this country to address so many of the structural failures that have left us uh, with this injustice that we see. The difference is that you are not going to bring that about 
just by voting the right way and passing the, uh, filing the right bill. That, those deals are not going to happen in the back rooms in Washington, D.C. You need a senator that is fully engaged in all aspects of that job. The, the, the revolutions that we talk about, from the, the American Revolution to bread and roses to women's suffrage to civil rights, it happens on our streets. And it's hard to be here on our streets when you are living in Washington, D.C. You spend less than a week a month before this election cycle in Washington. But you say that you have to be there to vote, but again, during this time of COVID-19, of economic and public health crisis, you miss over 50% of the votes. And if you want to go bring about the change that you say we need, then in 2018, when Republicans had the House, the Senate, and the presidency, you literally went nowhere, campaigned for no one to help bring about that change. Okay. So if you are not here in Massachusetts, and you are not in Washington, and you are not out there on the front lines campaigning to bring about the change that we need, then yeah, I think Massachusetts deserves more out of its senator. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. First of all, Congressman Kennedy and I, during the time we've served together, we each have a 95% voting record in Washington. 95% apiece. So just put that to rest. But on this issue of uh, change, well, I took on the oil industry and the auto industry to increase fuel economy standards uh, and the largest single reduction in greenhouse gases in American and world history. That's my law. I took on the NRA uh, to have now five, $25 million being spent at the CDC to do research on the causes of gun violence in our society to make NRA stand for not relevant anymore in American society. That's my law. I have a 25 to $30 billion program to find the cure for Alzheimer's by the year uh, 2025. That's my law. I have a bill which, has that, which put the internet on the desk of every single child in our country, and I'm fighting hard right now to make sure they get it at home during this pandemic because 12 million children do not have it. That's my law. So the difference between us is that I have more than 500 laws on the books that have been signed by presidents. The job of a senator is to go to Washington to pass laws, to get them signed, to help the people back in your home state. That is what I do. The congressman himself has said that he's got 13 bills that have passed, and in his own words, most of them small and insignificant. The difference between us is that we have a job, and okay. it's to go to Washington, and it's to get bills passed that help people back home. I do that. Less than a minute to break. He split it. Go ahead. So... I don't think, Senator, that providing hearing, making hearing aids more affordable is insignificant to our seniors in need of hearing. Those are your words. I don't think that the overhauling industrial or advanced manufacturing policy to revitalize American manufacturing for communities like Fall River is insignificant. I don't think that providing, guaranteeing mental and behavioral health care for pregnant women and new moms is insignificant. I don't think that banding with pulling the other coalition to actually fight for economic opportunity in the south coast of Massachusetts is insignificant. Maybe you do. No, but you, I stand by... No, you use the word small and insignificant. I'm only quoting uh, you so and using your own words to describe the 13 bills. So you I, use those words. I characterize my own legislative record as small and insignificant. I find that hard to believe. Okay, on that note, gentlemen, <laughs> let's take you. a breather, have a sip of water. When we Thank come you. back, taxes, jobs, and partisanship among the topics on the agenda as the Democratic primary Senate debate continues here on WBZ. Stay with us. Welcome back to our debate between the incumbent, Senator Ed Markey, and the challenger, Congressman Joe Kennedy. And I've been remiss here. Some of these questions that you're hearing were submitted by voters via social media, and we appreciate all the input, including this one. And Senator Markey, you'll go first on this. Uh, in the past, you both boasted of your ability to form productive working relationships with your Republican colleagues. But in this era of harsh partisanship, uh, former Vice President Biden has drawn fire from within the Democratic Party for suggesting that if President Trump is defeated, Republicans in Congress will have, quote, an epiphany and return to the bygone days of working with Democrats in a bipartisan manner, a move he says he'll welcome. His critics call that naive and out of touch with reality. Who's right, Biden or his critics? One moment, one minute, please. Well, we hope that when Donald Trump is fumigated out of the White House, in November, and Republicans lose control of the Senate, and they're in the minority, that they will see the light. 
uh, and they will begin to cooperate on a bipartisan basis. That's what we hope. But if they don't, there's a big agenda next year on health care, on the economy, on education, on criminal justice. Justice, 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 justice. It's on the ballot in November, and it will be the agenda next January. And if the Republicans continue to be obstinate and obdurate, then we'll just have to change the filibuster rules in order to get that agenda passed. Because America can't wait. Justice must be delivered, especially to those essential workers in our country who right now are running the risk of catching the coronavirus and giving it to their own family. We can see who they are. They're poorer. They're black, they're brown, they're immigrants, and we need to ensure that we put in a, an agenda on the books that the Republicans, if they block it, cannot stop because we just change the rules. Thank you, Congressman Kennedy. A return to bipartisanship is that naive and out of touch. One Look, minute. Uh, I, I hope not, but I fear so. And that's why, John, uh, I would point you to the way in which I've gone about my job over the course of the past four terms in Congress, the majority of those under Republican control. The bills that I referenced a moment ago all passed with under Republican control of the House. But I was able to find areas of overlap and to push those, that legislation through. The difference between myself and Senator Markey is that I'm not content just to say that that is going to be enough. He talks about a big, bold agenda. We need to have a big, bold agenda. The difference is he'll vote for it. I'll fight for it. That big, bold agenda doesn't just come about because we wish it to be so. You've got to go out there and make it so. You've got to be here. In, on our streets in communities like Chelsea and Fall River and Brockton and Springfield, listening to the concerns uh, of, our, of our constituents. You've got to take that fight nationally. He likes to cite the support that he's gotten in his uh, similar bills with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders. The difference is they are in every corner of the country fighting for that change, and he has gone nowhere to make it come to pass. Re rebuttal. Well, I introduced the Green New Deal with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a year and a half ago. So we would have real environmental justice in our country as we solved the, um, the, uh, the problem of climate change for the planet, that we would save all of creation by engaging in massive job creation. But Alexandria and I, we made sure in the Green New Deal, which was criticized, by the way, not just by Republicans and Fox News, but it was criticized by many Democrats as well, just going too far, because we, we talked about intersectionality. We talked about frontline communities. We talked about people of color. We talked about uh, how those who are in the most uh, polluted situations invariably are the poorest. They're the immigrant families, and we could see that during the coronavirus. So when I introduced that bill, yeah, it was poo-pooed in certain circumstances, but it seems prescient today. And by the way, the same thing is true about Medicare for All. When I stood next to Bernie in 2017 introducing Medicare for All, Congressman Kennedy took two years uh, to sign on to Medicare for All. That now looks like predictive of where we are right now. Millions of people have lost their health care. We're 47th in the world in life expectancy. We're 38th in health outcomes. Last year, two-thirds of all bankruptcies were because of health care bills. Medicare for all now looks like it's a bill that has, a, has its time that has arrived the same as uh, the Green New Deal. That is the leadership that I provide building movements across our country so that we can have the fundamental change which our country Re wants and needs. Response. Senator, it took you 40 years in office to show leadership on Medicare for All. 40 years. So let's get that record straight first. Second, the facts belie what you say because those movements aren't built in Washington. You are not here. You're here less than a week a month. Or a week a month. But you're not out there campaigning to drive that change. Bernie Sanders is out there building a movement, whether that's on racial justice or social justice or economics, and agree or disagree with it, which, by the way, you endorsed Hillary Clinton twice. You never endorsed Senator Sanders in his run for the presidency. Never. So the idea that you are somehow leading that same movement that you now claim to try to, rest, to, to hold just is not the case. because. You're not here on our, in our communities, and you're not out there in, our, in our, every corner of our country galvanizing those forces to actually bring this to pass. Because as your own campaign has said, when Democrats were desperate for that change, when Republicans had the House and the Senate and presidency, I traveled to dozens of districts to bring about, uh, to win the House and hold this administration accountable and pass progressive change. And you, Senator, went nowhere. Nowhere. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Look. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I, in introducing the Green New Deal, has created a movement of millions of young people 
across this country. The Sunrise Movement. They're on every campus, high school, middle school in our country right now. Young people rising up, demanding that we solve that problem. It's at the grassroots in our country. It's changed the whole debate in the way in which people view this issue. Uh, President Biden has now asked Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, to advise him on climate change. And in fact, President Biden now says that the Green New Deal is the framework for the climate change legislation that we will pass next year. That is a movement that came from the grassroots of our country. That is a movement which I built with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It's why the Sunrise Movement is with me, the Sierra Club is with me, the League of Conservation Voters is with me, which the National Resources Defense Council is with me, because I built a movement that is going to change our country and our planet next year with wind and solar, all electric vehicles, plug-in uh, uh, plug batteries with an energy efficiency strategy that is going to create millions of jobs in our country and do so with justice. Not just jobs, but justice for every family, especially families of color. I want to move on, but go ahead. You, he began, so you can finish. 47 years. And then, now we have this. And, Senator, if that's, if that's the movement that we're building, then why not go out and fight for it? Why not go out there and actually build it? Because your, your own campaign says that you've been here. And you haven't been out there building it. You've been, and you weren't in Washington. You missed those votes for, for months on end. So... If that's, if that's where the fight is, then why aren't you fighting for it? And that's, that is the difference, folks. You support it. I support the Green New Deal. I was on it from day one. The difference is that I will fight for this. I am 39 years old. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. I'm... <laughs> we need environmental justice in our country. The difference is that I know that that's not just, not just going to come to pass. Those fossil fuel interests that you talk about, they'll put up a fight for every last obstruction that they can. But you're the guy that took a donation from the chairman of ExxonMobil, or board member from ExxonMobil during this campaign, not me. If we're going to actually do this, we need to bring that fight to every corner of our country. And you haven't. All right, you Look at right, 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 right now, there is a super PAC run by the congressman's twin brother that are running negative ads against me on television all day long, every single day. And there are media reports that his father, his father, may be providing funding for that super PAC. And again, that funding could be coming from some of the fossil fuel money that his father raised as a congressman because he's using that money right now to attack me. So my question is, if he wants to go to this issue, my question is this, is your father funding that super PAC that is attacking me right now. No clue, no idea. And Senator, let's be very clear about this. The only reason why there is a super PAC in this race, the only one, is because you would not stay good to your word. You signed a pledge back in 2013 to keep super PACs out. Jen Liz Reardon and I gave you that, came to you to ask you to do the same thing. She and I signed that pledge. You refused to. You have had, there's been negative ads on me, digital ads put forward by your campaign for a long time. You, your campaign, your super PAC, is funded by a telecom billionaire, a private equity billionaire, and one of the folks that funded Mitt Romney's super PAC when he ran for president. You have taken more money from the telecom industry than any living member of Congress. So if we want to talk about campaign finance reform, I asked you multiple times to keep this money out. You said no. Here's the difference. Here's the, John, here's the, oh, here's the difference. Wrap it up. Here, well, no, this is an important subject, John. Here's the difference. The difference is this. This, this um, super PAC is running relentless negative ads. I challenge the congressman to say that if any super PAC gets in, that it only be positive and that it be disclosed money. And so right uh, now what the congressman is saying is, with all these relentless ads coming in, he says, I have no idea if my father... He's saying, I have no idea if my father is providing the funding for all of these negative ads that are being run, because they should be positive. Any super PAC for me should be positive, any super PAC for him. So here's what I would say to the congressman. I'm sure your father's watching right now. Tell your father right now that you don't want money to go into 
a super PAC that runs negative ads. And Just Senate. tell your twin brother and tell your father you don't want any money to be spent on negative ads in Massachusetts I've in 2020 in the era of Donald Trump. Senator, respond. I've said that multiple times. Have you told your father that? I've said that publicly multiple times. Have you times. said it to your father? I, publicly. Have you said it to your father? Publicly, Senator. Tell your father Senator, you don't want the money I've to be spent it. on negative ads. Senator. Do you want it? Do you, Senator. Will let you make that point? Let him answer. Senator. Okay, sure. When I asked you back in February at a debate whether you would stand by your word, and you said there needed to be positive voices. Hold on. You said there needed to be positive voices. You know what those, when you didn't have an answer for who was to judge those positive voices? It's because of those workers like Miles Calvey and the IBEW, the folks that ended up losing their jobs because okay. of your bill, and you wouldn't meet with them. They have a very different take on some of your positive voices of, because of the economic devastation that it brought for those families. Okay. okay. I, the, the, look at the, the viewers want to hear some John, other look at, issues. Look, look at, my, my campaign Ten seconds, is, please. My campaign is people-powered. Congressman Kennedy's campaign against me is now fossil-fueled. And all okay. I want him to do is tell his father I've to stop spending times. money on negative commercials okay. in Massachusetts in the era of Trump. We should all You've be positive with a vision, a big vision, for where this country is going. Instead, the congressman is running a relentlessly negative campaign, which I do not think is good for Massachusetts, and he should tell his brother, so, his twin brother, and ten, his father to stop. Ten it. seconds. That, uh, Senator, if we're going to... Your campaign supporters have put out tweets and... Uh, have, have bullied my supporters, have put out tweets saying that Lee Harvey got the wrong Kennedy, that where is Lee Harvey Oswald? And not a word coming from you, not a word. So cut the negative complaining. Look at If that's, no that's one, no, not a word from you or your campaign. No, I obviously would never at any time uh, accept anyone saying that about your family. And no one affiliated with my campaign would ever say anything like that. They and did. So I, 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 say, I, I say to you, okay, that that is just something which is completely unacceptable. It should not be in politics. And I make that a pledge to you that is absolutely wrong. Okay, let's move on. Thank you. And I believe uh, that you will take this first, uh, uh, Mr. Barkey. Uh, among the issues facing the next Congress will be massive budget deficits. What specific tax hikes will you support to help dry up that red ink? One minute. Th thank you. Um, there were massive unjustified tax breaks given during the Bush administration and during the Trump administration. All of them should be repealed. 80% uh, of them went to the upper two percentile. We need those revenues in order to make sure uh, that we have Medicare for all, that we have a Green New Deal that families get access to the education which they need for their family members. We have to make sure that we provide the help for everyone who needs it. We have to think big in 2021. And not only do we need to increase taxes, we also need to cut the defense budget. It is bloated. Uh, there is upwards of a trillion and a half dollars of new nuclear weapons built into the defense budget uh, over the next generation. We do not need any new nuclear weapons. We must cut those programs and transfer them into the health care, the education, uh, and all the rest of the programs that we need for the people in our country. Mr. Kennedy, tax hikes you'll support to dry up the deficit. Yes, look, this needs to, uh, we need to repeal the Bush level, the Bush era tax cuts, and we need to repeal the Trump, Trump tax cuts. That's exactly where we should start. But that's not going to be enough in order to actually bring about the structural change that I believe we need. But. In addition to those tax changes, John, we also need to address the fact that workers have been exploited now for generations. Uh, we've seen an erosion of worker power in this country that has been taking place literally over the course of the past 50 years. From the decreased uh, percentage of union households, to the flattening of wages, to the economic ability <clears throat> of American families to be able to meet their own needs. And the fact is that much of that has happened on Senator Markey's watch. And, and look, that fight for economic dignity, that is why I got into office. That is why I ran for it. Because the central promise that this country makes our people is that you're going to be able to make ends meet. And we have to update that social compact when it comes to issues like affordable child care for every family. It is more expensive to send a, ch a child to care for a child from birth to five every year, John, than send them to college in this state. That needs to change. Rebuttal. Uh, well. <clears throat> 
Look, this is just a question of justice. Um, in our country right now, for example, there are 12 million children without the internet at home. And that's going to lead to a homework gap that's going to lead to a learning gap, which is going to lead to an opportunity gap for those children. So building on my $54 billion internet program for every child on their desk in the classroom, I'm down in Washington right now fighting for the $4 billion to make sure that those 12 million children get the internet at home. Otherwise, we're going to have an educational tragedy in our country. And the same thing is true. We need to ensure that there is paid sick leave, that there is paid child leave, uh, that we ensure that everyone get the basic income that they need in our country. We have to think big next year, but in this coronavirus package right now, we have to protect those children. We have to protect our fishermen here in Massachusetts. We have to make sure that there's an extension for the unemployment benefit uh, for all of the workers here in Massachusetts. That's what I am fighting for right now on the floor of the United States Senate, and that our cities and towns get the funding they need so they don't have to lay off teachers our public safety, our health care officials right now. That is the fight that's being waged on the floor of the United States Senate, and I am standing up and fighting for them in the same way that the people of Massachusetts would want their senator to fight. Response. Much of the details that Senator Markey just related are core aspects of the HEROES Act, a bill that passed the House of Representatives literally months ago. And the reason why we could pass it? Because we won the House. So we could actually set the terms of that debate passed legislation that supported our hospitals and our first responders and our families and states and municipalities so that teachers can get to work and the additional 50 billion we just provided for child care centers that is the difference of what so what happens <clears throat> when you have folks that will go out there and actually campaign across this country to deliver change senator markey has been in office for 47 years he's had the chance to do that and when we needed him most progressive voices to drive that change to hold the Senate or to flip the Senate. He didn't do that. We're seeing the consequences of it right now. Go ahead, briefly. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, I just have to correct the Congressman once again. Back in March, when the coronavirus hit, I actually crossed the aisle, went over to the Elastic Delegation with Elizabeth, uh, and we said, we need $300 million for the fishermen. We got that passed. It's in the coronavirus package for New Bedford, for Gloucester. Uh, it was very clear that the gig workers of Massachusetts, 255,000 of them, would have no unemployment benefits at all from the state or the federal government. I was successful in making sure that they got $600. That lasts until the end of this year. The administration did not want to provide $150 billion in health care assistance. They only wanted to give 100. I recommended because of the leadership of our Massachusetts hospitals that we hold, that we fight. We got that money okay. and we got the money for testing as well. So on the floor of the Senate, in this tough fight, I stood, I fought, and I won for the people of Massachusetts. Well, since we're talking about jobs, and I know you wanted to have more to say on this, but I want to interject another question from a 60-year-old man who's been unemployed since December. He wrote in, a lot of us over 60 won't be able to find jobs again. Would you support lowering the retirement age to 60 with full benefits in Medicare? Mr. Kennedy. Uh, I think, look, this definitely is something that has to be considered. Uh, and John, this is the, what happens when you have economic policies that end up hollowing out our middle class. We've got uh, uh, folks that are coming up on retirement age for, uh, for Social Security that are seeing those savings get wiped out. We're also seeing uh, economic devastation for my generation, millennials, that are coming of age in the worst, the, the worst economic crisis after the worst economic crisis that they confronted 10 years ago. By almost every single statistic, they are worse off from their parents. They're delaying marriage, they're delaying children, they're not able to, to be able to afford the same semblance of lifestyle. But that's what happens when you have leadership that is asleep at the switch for the ability to provide economic dignity for our people. And that's why we need change. Mr. Markey, lower the retirement age to 60. Look at Medicare for all is the answer. He's afraid that at 60, he, won't, he would not be covered. So that's what Medicare for All is all about. That's what Bernie and I and Elizabeth were trying to accomplish when we introduced it back in 2017. It was to deal with this anxiety that exists in, in families all across our country. And this gentleman who you're talking about, he feels it right now. He may not easily find a job, especially in Massachusetts, at 17.4% unemployment, the highest in the United States. This anxiety is real. You know, my father drove a truck for the Hood Milk Company. Uh, my mother 
because my grandmother died, she had to actually raise her three younger sisters. And I grew up in that house with the truck driver. I could see the anxiety at the kitchen table for them trying to pay the bills. And that anxiety exists all across Massachusetts and our country right now. Families trying to pay the bills. Medicare for all for this health care issue goes right to the heart of ensuring that no one has to worry that their health care will be at jeopardy because they're not getting the insurance they need. Response. Uh, I am proud of the leadership that I've shown on health care in this country um, and my time in office from my work uh, trying to defend and expand the Affordable Care Act to the work that has been to protecting Medicaid and Medicaid expansion to my fight for Medicare for all because what we're seeing in this moment is that John your health infects mine and mine affects yours so yes we need to pass it the difference is I'm out there fighting for the change that will deliver it all right I want to squeeze in one more question and I'm gonna to have to do it now if we're gonna get it uh, you'll start here mr. Kennedy the pandemic appears to be widening the education access gap families with money are able to move their kids to private schools they believe are more protected from the virus or form learning pods where families pool their resources to hire private tutors. What, if anything, would you do to provide options for less affluent parents who don't feel safe sending their kids back to the local public school? One minute. So, John, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and this question about what do we do for schooling or daycare, it, it's... It is the topic every night for me and Lauren. Uh, because as of now, there's not a good decision. Uh, do you provide the <clears throat> educational opportunity and, and social emotional learning that our kids need? Or do you risk their health and the health of, of teachers and, and parents and other family members? Uh, what we are seeing is one, the need for that money to come in from the HEROES Act to actually provide resources so that we can, in fact, um, try to op reopen schools appropriately. But two, it is a consequence of literally decades of underfunding basic social services from child care and affordable child care to internet to, to schooling to health care and that's the problem that we have to confront and that's the challenge before us whether we're going to be big enough and bold enough and relentless enough to deliver on that change educational options for less affluent families you know, Mr. Markey you. big question minute. big question um, back when I was drafting the telecommunications act as the lead Democrat yeah, I was trying to break down all the monopolies so we would unleash the broadband revolution. We did, uh, and it created uh, trillions of dollars of new investment and, uh, and millions of new jobs. But I also did something else, and that was because of my cousin Mary, who was a teacher in Malden, a math teacher. I was in her classroom, uh, and she had one computer, and there were 25 kids. I asked the kids, how many of you have computers at home? Only four of them said they did. I said, how many of you would like them? All the kids in their class raised their hand and mauled it. That's why we have the internet rate. That's why the internet is now on the desk of every single child in America, because of my law that I got passed, $54 billion. Where we are right now is there's going to be a huge gap that opens up if we don't get the internet at home so they can learn. The poorest children, black, brown, all across our country, immigrant kids, there's going to be a huge problem that we're going to have to live with for generations if we do not get them the help. That's what I'm going to fight and win on the Senate floor over the next 10 days to make sure that funding is there for All every right. poor family in our country. All right, gentlemen, there's two minutes left. You each get half of it. Go. The Senator, there's still 18 towns in our Commonwealth that don't have access to broadband. You talk to folks in Western Massachusetts, they'll, you'll see some folks literally crowded outside a library to be able to get high-speed internet access. Right? That's, that's still the challenge that we confront. But look, everybody, you all have heard an awful lot of back and forth from us tonight. But let me simplify this debate and make it clear. This is about our future and the future of our Commonwealth and our country. And we have a choice to make because so many families are hurting and the last several months have been brutal. We have a chance to actually go big and to make sure that out of this wreckage comes a reckoning, or we can choose to do more of the same. I hope to have that chance to serve you in the Senate to make sure that we continue to build uh, on this change. Thank you, Mr. Markey. Equal time. Good. We still haven't heard from Con Congressman Kennedy on his father's funding of this super PAC uh, running negative ads. We heard the agenda for our country has to be justice next year, environmental justice, the Green New Deal, Medicare for all, health care justice. 
educational justice, criminal justice. That has to be what is on the ballot. That is what the agenda is next year. Martin Luther King said that all of our hands must be on the arc of justice to ensure that everyone has access to it in our country. I pledge to the voters of Massachusetts, and I ask for their vote, that I be given the honor of continuing to fight for justice for every person in our state and the entire United States of America. Gentlemen, thank you. Good debate. And that concludes our debate. Primary day is just three weeks away on September 1st. If you haven't done so, you still have time to vote early by mail. Call your local city or town hall or check the Secretary of State's website for more details. Early voting in person runs from August 22nd to the 28th. And of course, you can still go to the polls on Tuesday, September 1st. Make your voice heard. Then watch your vote count that night with full election coverage on WBZ, TV 38, and CBSN Boston. Stay safe and thank you very much for watching.